Hey folks, Quilly Teen here, and welcome to another tutorial for Civilization VI for complete beginners. As I said, I advanced time a little bit between this episode and last. We just finished our settler, and we're ready to start building our very first district and talking about that. But annoyingly, a barbarian encampment went and spawned over here. Barbarian encampments can basically spawn anywhere that there's kind of this fog of war. If no one's around, barbarians might spring up. You can actually help to counter that if you just keep some units sort of in these areas, then barbarians can't show up over there. But of course, we only had two units, and they were pretty busy up until now. So they uh, created a scout, which has come over here and has spotted my city. I really would prefer that this scout not make it back to this barbarian encampment, because if it does, this barbarian encampment will start producing a bunch of units that will come and start advancing towards Washington, which is really, really, really unpleasant. That being said, I also have to keep some military over here because I'm planning, well, I'm gonna settle somewhere with my settler. So first things is kind of a no-brainer. I'm gonna go ahead and have my warrior attack this bar this scout. Now, because this is a melee attack, my warrior, unlike my ranged attacks, my slinger, my warrior will take some damage in return over here, but not very much because a scout's not a very good fighting unit. And I do still have the policy that gives me a plus five boost versus barbarian. And because I'm fighting on my home continent and I'm America, I get a further plus five boost. So I'm getting a big bonus to combat over here, but Despite all that, it's not enough to kill the Barbarian. Do note there is a lens here for continents. It will color code the territory based on continents, but I haven't found... Uh, there's another continent over here, I think. Um, continent, America. Oh, well, I should really get over there. Whereas the current continent is Pangea Ultima. I don't believe this counts as, as having discovered the second continent, though. Um, I'm not certain. Maybe it does. Hmm. Okay, well, I've got my Slinger here. And what I think I would like to do, while I do kind of want to keep spotting, because I was really thinking of settling this area. Why would I think about settling this area? Well, there's a few different reasons. First of all, there's lots of good spots. It seems like a really good area over here. I mean, it's got some cattle, 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 stone. It's on a river. It feels good. It feels like a good, strong place for a city in some fashion. There's stuff going on, so that's really good. But of course, it's far from the only one. Here we've got more diamonds, we've got the crabs. Settling on the coast might be handy. Um, you can, you don't have to settle on the coast to build ships, as long as you build a harbor. So Washington will eventually be able to build a harbor over here, and then once it does, Washington will be able to build ships. Cities on the coast can start building ships right away, which is nice. The other thing is, once you set a city on a coast, you also get a boost towards sailing. So there's lots of things, like I might want to settle on the coast, either here or quite a bit further down here. But the reason I'm actually thinking about settling here first is because it's actually slightly towards the other civilizations. I still don't know where Congo is, um, which is kind of unfortunate. Mm, I'll send you a delegation. No, cannot say yes. Okay. I mean, that's not the way you exchange information. He might come around at some point and ask me to trade information with the... Um, with his capitals, but Egypt is there. And what I don't wanna do is sort of give up all this territory to Egypt. I tend to settle towards other civilizations first to sort of secure that territory and then backfill over here, unless someone happens to be down here, which is possible. But unless there is, most likely all this territory will eventually be mine, which is great. Do note that if you settle way too close to someone who's kind of aggressive, then things go badly. I've already been insulted once by Cleopatra here because, see, we're unfriendly. Um, she respects strong militaries and I don't have one. I only have two units and she doesn't think that's very impressive. So she does not like me. In fact, she'll probably denounce me at some point soon. So we'll have to be on our guard there. You can see I did get an alert that a barbarian was approaching my city of Washington. Yep, gotcha. Um, and so next up, oh, we have to choose production for Washington. So we did unlock the astrology technology, which unlocks Holy Sight, as well as the wonder, Stonehenge over here. You can see Stonehenge is grayed out. There's nowhere available for me to build Stonehenge right now. Wait, really? It's not even giving me the option of building it here or here? Maybe if I remove the resource or something, because these are fl this is flat land. That's interesting. I wonder why it's not even giving me an option to settle here or here. Must be adjacent to stone and on flat land. Hmm. I wonder if it didn't have the pasture, or I might have to go and actually harvest the stuff. But that's okay. I'm not planning on building Stonehenge. It would be nice but we don't have an option. These are hills, so we, we can't even have the option of building there. The holy site, however, is interesting. So again, I could build the monument. If I click on monument, that's it. I just start building the monument. In five turns, I'll have a monument inside of Washington. If I go, by the way, if you click on a city like this, and you click here, change production. So you do that. If I click on holy site instead, 
it doesn't just instantly start building a holy site. It wants to know where to build a holy site, and it requires a tile for that. A very different and unique thing that is brand new to Civ 5 or Civ 6, which I like a lot. Now, you can build your holy site on any of these lit up tiles. Yeah, it must be because there's an improvement. So I guess you'd have to go and tear up the improvement first. But I thought you'd be able to just like splot it down on there and it would get rid of it. Maybe it's because I don't have the tech to harvest the, I don't know. Anyway, it's fine. So I can build it on any of the tiles that are hi highlighted green. In addition to that, it also highlights tiles that aren't currently in my border. Yeah, I can't build it on the wheat either. Yeah, must need to harvest it first. Okay. In addition to that, it highlights tiles outside of my current borders that I could purchase to build the holy sites on. So, like, if I want to build it here, 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 or here, that would be fine. The other very notable thing is that most districts have some sort of adjacency bonuses. Now, we can tell if I go and just click off of that and then click on the city again. Okay, change production. I just had to get out of that mode. If I mouse over holy sites, um, oh, apparently I don't get any information here. Really? Okay. If I go into the Civilopedia, is totally what I meant to say, and look up holy site, I can see a few things. So, first of all, I can find out what the holy site does. First thing it does is it generates one great profit point per turn. Okay, we don't still don't know what great people are, but all right, that's probably a good thing, right? Also, it has all these adjacency bonuses listed. If it is adjacent to various things, it will produce faith every turn for free. Um, this, this display seems to list a lot more things, but it's a little bit deceptive because all of these here are just mountains, different types of mountains. So for every mountain tile it's adjacent to, it produces one faith per turn. If it were adjacent to a, whole, a natural wonder, that would be plus two faith. Also, for every two woods or two other districts it's adjacent to, it would produce plus one faith. So that's quite interesting. There's some other stuff, and we'll, show it, and we'll deal with that later on. But again, if I go back to Washington, click on Holy Sites, now we can start to understand. In fact, there's even little arrows here. If I were to build the Holy Site here, I would get plus one faith because it's adjacent to a mountain tile. It says it in tooltip. And if I look here, I can see the mountain icon here that is adjacent. I'm also adjacent to one, but only one forest, which isn't enough to give us a boost. I'm also adjacent to a district. Again, your your, your town center is a district. So um, right now, I would only have plus one faith in this tile because of the mountain. The, the one forest and the one district isn't enough to kick anything else in. Whereas if I built here instead, I would get plus two faith because it's actually adjacent to mountain tiles. You don't get the little markers because it's currently out of our borders, but do I must, yeah, I'll spend the money on this just to demonstrate it. There we go. So now this is within my borders and we can clearly see it's adjacent to two mountains. Therefore, it would get a plus two bonus. So that's pretty good. And in fact, I think we will indeed build the holy site here so we can get more faith right now. I mean, we haven't really looked at what faith does, but more stuff seems more better. So let's go and build the holy site here. Now, there is something else to consider. You do get an adjacency bonus for every two districts a holy site is adjacent to. If I built it here, it would be adjacent to only one district, our city center. Later on, though, if I were to build another district, say a campus or a theater square, maybe here or here, right? So if we build the holy site here, and then I build the theater square here, theater square is another district type, now all of a sudden the holy site would be adjacent to two districts, and it would get a whole extra faith from that. So you can sort of start planning for the future. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to build the holy site here. Another district that gets a bonus from being adjacent to mountains is the campus. If I were to then later on build a campus here, the campus would get plus one science from being next to the mountain. We get an extra plus one science because it would be adjacent to two districts, the city center and the holy site. So that, I, I like this. I'm going to go holy site here and a campus here. Alternatively, I could go holy site here and campus here. In the end, the end, both sites would get plus two thingies once it's all said and done. But since I'm building a holy site first, and this place gives us a bigger bonus immediately, I will go and build a holy site district there. So now that I've done that, you get this cool graphic. The holy site is under construction, but it will take seven turns for us to complete that. But that's very cool. The holy site doesn't produce any faith by itself normally. It has to be adjacent to stuff, but it does produce great people points. I keep talking about that. Let's take a look at what that is. Here is our great people screen, this button. If we click on this, opens up this screen, and you can see all the different types of great people 
which exist in the game. Great General, Great Admiral, Great Engineer, Merchant, Prophet, Scientist, Writer, Artist, Musician. Each one of these types of great people tends to do something kind of specific, right? Specific, shut up, it's a word. The great scientists tend to do sciencey things. Great prophet, well, great prophets always found religions. Great merchants tend to do money things. Great engineers tend to do production things, but it's not even that clear. It's kind of a fuzzy wuzzy kind of thing. And I say ten because they're all different. The first great scientist available is called Hypatia. Excellent. Wikipedia Hypatia. Very interesting character here. Um, her ability is if you have a campus district, I mean, it doesn't say campus, but what it does is it, she will instantly build a library in the district where you where you activate her, right? You tend to use great people. They don't tend to do anything just sitting around, although great generals and admirals do. Most great people don't just do anything just by being around. Instead, you use them, and they tend to be a one-shot deal. Some people, like this great artist, for example, would actually be a three-shot deal because of three works of art. But Hypatia would be a one-shot person you activate once, it would build a library for free in a campus, and for the rest of the game, all your libraries would produce plus one science. That's freaking huge! That's amazing! Holy cow, that's a lot of extra tech. Really, I mean, free library by itself, really good. All your libraries being super awesome for the rest of the game, that's fantastic! So how do you get Hypatia? Well, the default way to recruit any great people is to produce great people point. So Hypatia requires 60 great scientist points to recruit. Unfortunately, we're currently creating zero great scientist points per turn. Congo is producing one per turn. They have probably built a campus. A campus produces one great scientist point per turn. The, how do you get great profits? Same thing, great profit points. When we finish our holy site, we will be producing one great profit point per turn. So eventually we'll be able to recruit one. You can see we have an unmet player who built a holy site, well, presumably four turns ago, so they're a bit ahead, but that's fine. And so on and so forth. Everyone's got that sort of thing. In addition to that, you can also spend gold or faith to recruit great people. And the cost to recruit these go down the closer you get to being able to recruit them through your normal points. So if there's someone with a bonus that you really, really, really like, um, like I really quite like Hypatia's bonus a lot. So if I was sort of partway there and it looked like someone was going to beat me, I might be tempted to finish the job with either Faith or Gold. The NC is very expensive. Later on, actually it comes up a lot more, especially Faith. Unless you're doing really hardcore religious -y things, you tend to use your Faith actually to recruit great people. It's a very, very, very powerful ability. Um, so right now we've got nothing, but that's what the great person point is. So we have two city-states, two city-states that want us to create a great merchant. So if we were to produce great merchant points, which you would normally get out of a commercial hub district, every district, well, that's not 100% true, but it's mostly true. Every district produces great people points of their appropriate type. So a commercial hub will create great merchant points every turn automatically. And again, there are other things that can produce more points. Plus, um, the buildings. So you build, a, say, a, a campus, and then you can build a library in that. The library produces even more great people points, and so on and so forth. When we fin excuse me, when we finish the holy site, we'll be able to build a shrine inside of it, which will produce a more faith and b great people points or great profit points, um, which is really really nice. Okay, so this settler here, I have to be careful because this scout could capture the settler. Now, scouts don't tend to be very aggressive, as far as I can tell, about capturing um, civilian units, but they can do it. I'm actually, even though this is kind of a risk, I'm going to do this, because I want to move my settler in this direction, for one. And two, even if the scout moves in here and captures a settler, the scout is then going to get beat on by my warrior, so I feel pretty secure about that. And honestly, I would probably be happier if the scout quote-unquote, captured the settler temporarily. I'd then be able to liberate the settler. It'll be fine. I'd be happier if it did that than if it ran away to go and tell its buddies about the location of Washington. I think it's still going to run away, but we'll see. Meanwhile, my slinger, in two turns, I'll be able to upgrade it to an archer, which I want. So I'm going to actually move it towards Washington over here so that it can do an upgrade. Let's find out what the scout decides to do. Probably it's just going to run away. Yeah. Which is, I have to admit, a little bit annoying to me. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to start by moving the warrior, and I can't attack the scout because it's across river. 
because it that will eat my turn. So instead, I'll just move down this way to try to keep pace with the scout. Uh, when I talked about zones of control, it does not, they do not extend across rivers, so the, the scout is completely unaffected by the position of my warrior. Meanwhile, my slinger is going to move over here into friendly territory. Next turn, I'll be able to spend gold to upgrade him to an archer, which is fantastic. And while you can only have one unit per tile normally, military units and civilian units can share the same tile, like that. And in fact, it's quite common to do that to protect, say, your settler to escort. May the forces oh, that's of interesting. evil become confused while your arrow is on its way to the target. Nice little quote there. Uh, it's interesting. It's not running directly here. I guess they're still scouting around. And they do scout. The barbarians have to sort of discover the world. So he's not running right back here, which is probably very good for me. Um, I'll just cross the river for now, and we'll see if we can't keep the scout pinned down. This slinger, I'm going to go and... Ooh, it's a tough decision, actually. Because here's the thing, I don't really want to send the Settler out completely unescorted. So maybe I will actually keep the Slinger and the Settler around. Now I could move them individually, I could move the Settler, then move the Slinger. But there's an actually really convenient little tool here. Notice every time you have the Settler selected, it automatically puts on that Settler lens, so you can see what's going on. There's a cool little tool here that creates an escort formation, and it just, all it does, it, oh look at that, it makes a little connecty graphic over here. All it does is it makes it so that when you move one unit, they both move at the same time. Just just a little quality of life thing. So now I've got to decide where I want to settle. The AI is saying, hey, why don't you settle up here? And honestly, I kind of like that. Again, part of my reason for settling in this direction rather than settling to the south was the idea of I want to sort of mark out my territory and then backfill it later on, right? I want to prevent the AI from taking this sort of space. This is very choke pointy over here. Rivers are really good for defense because it's slow for units to move across them. And if units try to attack across rivers, um, they get a penalty. Also the mountains being here, which can't be entered, makes it that much harder for say if Egypt, or I don't know, I still don't know where the Congo is, but assuming the Congo is over here, makes it that much harder for them to quickly get to my city. So it's defensive. And we know that mountains are really good places for you to build districts next to. So, that's not bad. And in fact, I think I will build my first city up there. Even if I build... So if I built a city here, I would still later on be able to build a city in A2, because that would be four tiles away. But I think, while, while this position here is probably the most defensive, I will actually go and build it on the other side of the river. It'll make it slightly more convenient for me to place another city at A3, or maybe even over here later on. So that's going to be okay. Slinger is not the ideal escort for a settler because it is weak in melee and it's um, so it's not a very defensive unit, but I think it's going to be sufficient for our purposes over here. Okay, we've got the holy site. Everyone else has moved. We have to choose new research because archery just finished. What am I going to get? Well, if I am worried about warfare and attacking, I could consider getting masonry, especially since I've already got the boost for it, which is nice. Masonry unlocks the ability to build walls in your cities. If you build walls in your city, your city will have more hit points, which means it's going to be that much harder to conquer. Cities have a strength. You can see Washington here has a strength of 13. If an enemy warrior were to come and attack Washington, Washington would automatically hit back in melee with a strength of 13. And Washington has a certain amount of hit points. Once all the hit points are gone, an enemy melee unit can then walk into Washington and conquer it. Having walls gives you, well, you can see here the ancient walls gives you an extra 50 points of outer defense. Also, walls allow your cities to perform ranged attacks. All of a sudden, our city would have a ranged attack with range two and would be able to shoot at enemies that are nearby, which is really good. Really, really good. So if I was paranoid about that, I may want to consider early masonry. I'm not really paranoid about that. I'm feeling relatively secure here. Um, in fact, one of the other things, if you are paranoid about being attacked, you know what helps? Build more units. We could unlock the wheel here, which would allow us to build heavy chariots. It's worth noting heavy chariots do not require you to have a horse resource. Um, and the way to look at it, the way I think about it anyway, is the horses here, these are like really good, like primo riding horses. Whereas the horses that you need to, you know, drag a heavy chariot around, they, you know, it's, it's, they're a lot easier to come by is probably the way to think about it. But if you want to build horsemen, you do need horses around to do that. And we do have a boost here. Horses have a melee strength, or horsemen have a melee strength of 35 and a movement of four. Compare that to our warrior, which has a strength of 20 and a movement of two. We could go and work towards the spearmen here. Spearmen has a strength of 25. They're a little bit more powerful than um, 
than warriors, and they're particularly good against mounted units, but we don't have the boost for that yet. I suspect we will soon. Hmm. That's a good question. Wheel also unlocks the water mill um, building, which isn't bad. More food, more production, especially if you happen to have rice or wheat, and we do in Washington. So that's not bad. That is that is a tricky set of choices. What do you pick? Eh, whatever. Um, you know what? Let's let's take horsemen actually. Kind of like that idea. So you guys are all doing that. Next turn. What is that an Egyptian warrior buzzing around here? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. We're gonna go and advance a little bit towards the scout. Although I don't expect we'll catch it. The scout has a movement rate of three. We only have a movement rate of two. We're very unli unlikely to catch it, but maybe we can box it in somewhere. It's a lot easier to kill if you got more than one unit, and especially if you have a ranged. Um, I'll do this. Because of the zone of control, if he moves here or here, he'll be forced to end his turn. He could still move away, but he's kind of getting pinned in here, so this is looking pretty good. We're three turns away from the holy site, and we're still advancing over here. More Egyptian... Oh! Hello! We've met Japan! Pleasure to meet you! Love the Triforce. Good luck, good luck buddy. Mm-hmm. Flowers are interesting. So that's Hojo, and we're going to be very nice to him. It's an honor to meet you. Yes, we'll exchange information about our capitals. Where are you? Oh, you're way, way down here. On the other side of the city-states. So again, I'm feeling kind of secure that this, so far, has my name on it. Unless we discover that there's someone living down here. We can only pan the map so far away right now, because we haven't really discovered the extent of the world. So we don't even know where the poles are. For all I know, we could be quite far to the north, or we could be quite far to the south. There's some desert over here, so it makes me think this is a little bit more equatorial, but it's not guaranteed. Oh, and there's another scout, barbarian scout to the north. So there's probably another barbarian encampment up here, and we're going to have to deal with that real soon. For now, though, I don't know if the scout moved here or to the south. I'm going to gamble to the south. And I'm going to lose. So the, the scout we were chasing is over here. That's a damn shame. Okay, but we'll make do. So next turn we're going to cross the river, and I'll probably settle there. There you are. So now he actually can't escape me. Because if he moves here, it'll end his turn. Because it's going to be adjacent to me. He actually still has one movement left. Because again, scouts have a movement of three. Cost him two to enter here. He could. He would probably love to move over to here. But he can't because of the zone control. We got a boost towards state workforce. Uh, because we built a district! Hooray! So I was researching this, but I got the boost, so we got a big kickstart over here. By the way, there's kind of a cool trick. One thing you can do, um, even if you don't have the boost for something yet, you could research halfway through something. And then when you get about halfway, switch to something else. You can totally do that. It'll remember how far you got. And then later on when you get the boost, it'll actually finish your research, which is kind of awesome. Also, it's kind of awesome... Killing Barbarian Scouts. Okay. He never got back to his village. This village... Oh. Oh! It got cleared out. Someone else cleared out that Barbarian encampment. It could be one of the city-states, or it could have been Japan, or it could have been all kinds of different things. Well, this is the Japanese guy we met. But there's someone else is around here and cleared out the Barbarian encampment. That's maybe why the scout didn't go back south. But we know there's probably another one over here. Scout came, saw our borders, and then started running away. That does not make me very happy. So we're going to have to look into that real soon. Okay, now we've got a few more build options over here. So we can build, again, the monument in our city district itself, giving us extra culture. I can now build a shrine in my holy site. The shrine will give us plus two faith and, um, and an extra great profit point per turn. It also says plus one citizen slot. What the heck does that mean? Also, when you look up something like holy site, holy site, it says something like, Citizen yields per citizen plus two faith. Well, here's the deal. When we look at our city, and let's say we do manage citizens over here, right? You can assign citizens to different places. Notice that the holy site, we can't assign a citizen to this tile at all. We cannot. But if we were to build a shrine here, the shrine gives you a citizen slot, which means then at that point, we could assign a citizen to work this tile and what would that tile give us? Well, it would give us that that person working in the shrine would generate two faith. Every citizen in, working in the holy site district generates two faith. The shrine lets us put one citizen in there. Later on, when we build a temple, we could put a second citizen in there for even more faith. Now, you don't tend to do that very much because 
Ooh, that's we're gonna deal with that in a second. You don't tend to do that very much because remember, each citizen requires two food to be fed to survive. And the citizens working the shrine don't produce any food. All they do is produce faith. So they don't feed themselves. And unless you have a city that produces a lot of excess food, it might be very difficult for you to work those locations. That being said, this is probably an excellent time for us to talk about housing. I've mentioned it a little earlier because we saw there's a few things that can give us bonus housing. Oh, when we're talking about where to place our cities, right? Fresh water, like being next to a river or a lake or an oasis, gives you plus three housing in a city. What is the deal with that? Well, if we look at Washington, Washington currently has three people in it. If we look at housing capacity over here, it says three of six. And in fact, if I toggle on the city details and scroll down, we can get a bigger breakdown of the housing. We have six housing for three citizens. Housing from buildings, one. Housing from water, five. So your cities at a base get, um, what's the best way to, to say this? I guess the best way to say it, your city as a base has a housing limit of two. I believe the palace in our capital gives us an extra one. And being adjacent to fresh water gives you an extra three. So housing from water will be either two if you're in the middle of nowhere. It'll say three if you're on a coast. It'll say five if you're next to fresh water. And I believe we're getting plus one from our palace, which you automatically get for free in your capital. I might be wrong about this. Could be lying. Things have happened. Um, we don't Because we don't have any buildings. Yeah, we don't have any buildings that give us any housing right now. Housing is not actually the limit of your city's size, but it kind of sort of is. When you are just one shy of your limit. So if we had five citizens right now, five citizens for six houses, those five citizens are fine. But at that point, all your excess food is going into your sixth citizen, right? So you're going to, you're trying to go from five to six. Well, because that is the last, that's your last house, you actually get a penalty to growth. It would show up right here, housing multiplier. Right now it's a one. So however much food we're making per turn, which is currently 3.3 .3 excess food per turn, we would then multiply by this housing multiplier, which is currently one. So our total is 3.3. .3. That's great. If we were at five citizens, our housing multiplier would actually become 0.5. So we take 3.3 .3 multiplied by 0.5. So we'd be cutting it in half. So we'd only be growing half as fast. If we reach or exceed our housing cap, if we had six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever citizens for six housing, then your housing multiply multiplier goes down to 0.25. I believe that's correct, which means you're only growing at a quarter of the speed that you could be. So housing gives you the ability to grow your city more. It's not actually a, a, a limit, but it's mostly a limit because growing at a quarter speed is really, really, really bad. So... At some point, you need to maintain your housing level and keep it going up. Um, can't remember. There was I thought there was something I was going to relate to that. I'm not sure. Maybe not. Now, there are several buildings that give you extra housing. For example, if you do get pottery, the granary gives you one extra food per turn, which is nice, helps your city grow, but also counts as plus two housing. Hey, that's really good. Um, also... A lot of different improvements that you build give you at like a half a point of housing. Every farm counts as a half a point of housing. I believe fishing boats do as well, and a few other things do too. So you can increase your housing quite a bit with more improvements. Ah, oh, that's very nice. And then, yeah, by, um, by placing your people in the correct location. I swear there was another thing I was going to bring up, but I can't remember what it is. Oh, well, we'll figure it out later. Okay, war! Uh, Mbemba Azinga. I can never say that name. It's the Congo. The Congo just declared war on Kabul. Kabul is a city-state. So the Congo must be over here. It, it's the only thing that makes sense. They must be over here. They're probably near Kabul. They decided to declare war on the city-state. They want to go and conquer that city. Perfectly legitimate move. Not entirely good for us. And really, really bad for Kabul over here. It'll be interesting to see if, if uh, the Congo can win that war. So what are we going to build next? Um, oh, that's what I was going to relate it to. I was talking about, you know, placing citizens to work in the shrine to generate faith. I said, it's often not good because those people can't make food. Therefore, your city, you know, won't necessarily be able to feed yourself. But if you happen to be at your housing cap, 
and you know you're not really growing anyway then maybe it becomes a really good thing to put your citizens in there shrines again you get faith and holy sites you can assign people to campuses for science you can assign people to industrial zones for production etc etc and these little bits and bobs that we talked about in like the first video i think maybe the second video to focus on something can influence the governor to place people in those districts even if you don't want to manage it manually all right so what are we going to do next um I'm tempted to go a shrine so that we can get more uh, great people points so we can found a religion a little bit sooner. I really do want another builder because I could very soon we're going to want more improvements in Washington and actually we'll want a builder to improve our new city over here. I do want another settler as well. I'm a little bit worried that um, you, uh, Egypt might declare war on me because I have a relatively no real army size. So I think I'm gonna build an archer. I should talk about these projects over here. Projects are special things that you can build in cities when you have districts. Because we have a holy site here, we can do holy site prayer. What this does is um, it takes a certain amount of production to sort of complete. Every turn while you're doing this, it's going to produce, basically when you do this, at the end of it, it's gonna produce a certain amount of faith and great profit points. And I believe it's a quarter of the production that you put in. That's how much faith you're going to get. But also the great people points, which is a great way if you do want to go and accelerate your rate of getting, say, a great profit. Like right now, we are going to get, it doesn't say it yet, but we are going to get one great profit point per turn because we did finish our holy site. If we want to really rush our religion, um, then we might want to start doing some holy site prayer or build a shrine, you know. But I'm going to feel a lot better with an archer, especially we know there's a barbarian encampment over here, which may have been alerted to our presence. Meanwhile, my settler over here, I'm going to go and settle a city over here because I don't feeling okay about it. Near the mountains is good. We can potentially get the silver here, cut off Egypt, which feels good. It does have some the, the, the cattle. It's got the stone. Also, all of this, um, all of this terrain over here, this is grassland. All of these produce two food, which means we've got a lot of food around to feed your people. You really want to try to make sure to place your cities, places where you can get a decent amount of food, um, as well as ideally get a whole bunch of housing as well. So I like this location. I'm going to found a city here and we've got Charleston. Excellent. This location could build Stonehenge. Currently it says it's going to take 60 turns over here, um, because our production is quite poor. Uh, yeah, 180 production. Currently, we're producing three production per turn. We could build it here or here. Either one would be adjacent to the stone. I think we're going to have to pass on that one, unfortunately. What do I want to build in Charleston? I'm going to actually get the monument up and running ASAP over here. Again, generally speaking, I do want more culture. And again, our borders will grow faster in a city the more culture we produce. And this is a little close to the front. I would love it if the borders grew quite fast over here. Your palace automatically creates... Um, culture so that's why we have any culture whatsoever it's because it's coming out of our palace um and it's also why washington got this tile we bought this one but this tile and this tile were automatically acquired by washington most likely it's going to go and expand either to the cattle or the furs next so yes in charleston i will go and build a monument that sounds great to me this slinger i'm going to upgrade you to an archer it's going to cost me 30 gold and it will end the slinger's turn but now we have an archer note it says plus 15 experience points but that's the experience it had before it just kept its previous experience i think it's because the way the game works is it like deletes the old slinger then creates an archer and then gives the new archer the same amount of experience i think that's why that pop-up happens but we still that little one number over here shows that this uh, unit has one promotion so we've definitely kept what we had before which feels great i need to heal up the warrior now the warrior is down 75 hit points you heal 10 hit points per turn, assuming I'm remembering that correctly, outside of your borders. Inside of your borders, I believe it's 15 per turn, and I think in a city you heal 20 per turn. Um, as far as I know, I might be lying to you, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. My archer over here, I'm going to move, I'm going to hunt down that barbarian encampment, if I can. There is a boost as well uh, to bronze working, if you kill three barbarians. You know we've already killed two. Oh, that's not good. We killed two, because we killed the spearman over here. And we killed the scout over here. So if we kill a third one, we'll get a boost towards bronze working. That's nice. Now, unfortunately, this is bad news bears. This means this barbarian encampment, wherever it is, somewhere over here, presumably, is on some horses. As such, they're going to spawn horsemen instead of, like, just warriors and whatnot. Horsemen are considerably more dangerous. They have 35 combat strength instead of just the 20 of a warrior, for example. They also move very, very quickly. That's going to make life a lot harder for me. Now, I could run all the way back into the city, which might not be a good, a bad idea. Or I could, so I could take one step back and still shoot. 
because of course archers have a range of two very 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 strong also archers or everything that is considered a ranged unit can fire after moving assuming they have any move left if i've moved twice and i'm at zero of two then i can't attack but if i move once like this and i have one of two left i can still shoot there's also siege class units which are ranged units but siege class units they are different because they can't fire after moving they can only fire if they have not moved at all but the upshot to them is they do do a lot more damage in general so i could shoot at this guy which actually is going to work out very well first of all i didn't realize something normally horsemen have a strength of 35. It looks like the Barbarian Horseman, however, if you look at this little chart at the bottom, actually only has a base strength of 20. So Barbarian Horsemen are exactly the same as Warrior units, um, except they have... Oh, it looks like only one extra movement. Okay, Barbarian Horsemen are a lot weaker than regular Horsemen. I'm not as worried as much. It does say they have a strength of 26 right now because he is in the forest ideal terrain really good defense so he's effectively got a strength of 26 right now on the other hand my archer has a bank strength of 25 i have a policy that gives me extra five against barbarian i am america so i have a plus five combat strength on my home continent and this unit has been promoted to have plus five strength against land units as a result my total strength is 40 i'm going to shoot this guy and take off half his hit points if he goes and attacks me I still have a lot of those bonuses versus Barbarians and for being on my home continent. Um, I will, I'll have strength 35 because I won't have the, I, I'm not going to have the advantage of attacking land units, but he's actually going to have his penalty to his strength because he's damaged. I feel very, very, very safe here with the Archer. Units get weaker, like they, they fight less well as they take damage. With the exception of Japan, they have a unique thing. Ooh, thank you. Your delegation is most welcome. Uh, they have a unique thing where their units, if we take a look at the, I don't think it's all their units. I think it's just the samurai. The samurai does not get combat penalties when damaged, so it always fights at full strength. So he did go, come and attack the archer. I took very little damage and he almost killed himself. And of course, I'll be able to finish him off this turn. Let me hold off on that though, because we have enough faith to choose a pantheon now which we're going to do. So a pantheon, every nation, as far as I know, every nation that produces any faith can eventually pick a pantheon. Um, and a pantheon is a belief that will be with you for the rest of the game. It is it's sort of a first step to getting a religion, but unlike in Civ V, having a religion spread to your nation does not invalidate your pantheon. There's a bunch of them with different bonuses. Which one you pick? Pick something that sort of fits your circumstances. Like, we have, um, we have stone in our capital and in Charleston, which we will build quarries on. Stone Circles gives us plus two faith from each quarry. That's not bad. I mean, we're producing 3.1 faith right now. That would be a total of four extra faith from our stone circles, right? Once we get the second quarry up. So we would be more than doubling our faith per turn by taking that. Well, that's pretty good. Or God of Craftsmen. It's a bonus production from mines over strategic resources. We have a mine on our diamond, but a diamond is a luxury resource, not a strategic one. So that wouldn't help there, but other things might happen. You can get God of War. That's kind of neat. It gives you faith uh, for every time you kill a unit within any tiles of a holy site. Oh, that's kind of fun. Fertility, your cities grow faster. God of Sea, quite good if you're on a coast. Really, really good if you're on the coast. Uh, better Wonders, more amenities. We haven't talked about that yet, uh, but amenities are city happiness, basically. Uh, we do have a pasture, but you know what? I kind of like stone circles, especially if I want to show off religion later on. So I'm going to go ahead and found this pantheon, which gives us a boost towards mysticism. Excellent. There's a pantheon effect over here. And if we take a look at our cities here, you can see that Charleston has the pantheon of stone circles and so does Washington. So Charleston's not getting a bonus from it right now, but in Washington, if I click on Washington and then go to manage citizens, and take a look at the uh, the stone over here. This stone, the stone quarry, still produces two food, still produces three uh, three production, but now produces two faith, which is pretty substantial right now. Huge bonus. Love that. All right, I'm going to go and rest this warrior. Um, fortify until healed. We're going to go and put a cut in here, 
And when are we going to come back? Because I'll probably skip forward until something else interesting happens. Oh my god, Cobble is getting its butt kicked. It's at half health. Congo is absolutely going to go and conquer Cobble, which is a little scary because next stop on the, the Congo hate train could be Soul or it could be me. Very curious. So, yeah, we'll continue on. At the very least, I do want to showcase the religion. So I'm going to advance the game until there's some other interesting things that start to happen. And we'll come back for another episode. See you there.